yeah, that's that's a story for another time. It was uh, it's way too close, and it is far far worse than what's being covered right now. There, uh, right. I talked to the sheriff on the way out, and he was saying the death toll is going to get it's going to get around a thousand people. It's just uh, pray for those people. It, it, buddy, it happened so fast. There was no warning. There was no way to get a warning out. There was no. It just. I mean, it was thirty feet a second, and we just watched it. It was. It was crazy. Yeah. Well, thank goodness well, thank you're out of there and back home safe and sound. So. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys. Oh, no. I was thinking about you the whole time. I kept thinking the whole time, like, Tony, 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 because I'm watching this. It becomes exponentially more personal when you've got a good friend there. So, okay. uh, it was. I mean, it, the videos are, are, are detailed, but the, the thing that was the craziest was the exploding cars, boats, and then the two gas stations blew up. So. Right. When we got evacuated and we're driving out of there, you know, racing or get away from the fire, you, it sounds like a, a war zone. It's just, it's, there's stuff blowing up everywhere. And, you know, buddy, the thing that was the weirdest is that, you know, I'm an athlete. I, I'm used to high pressure situations. I couldn't feel my hands. Mm. My hands got cold. It was the weirdest thing. So, I digress. That's another conversation. I, I know. appreciate that. That'll, that'll be a private yeah. conversation you and I have about that. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, yeah. The Pack 4. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We called it. We said this. You've got to have a clip somewhere where we said USC is going to leave the Pac-12 and it's going to fall apart. We've been saying this for years, you okay. and I. All there. Yes. I know. I know. I know. But, but again, again, you and I are told you know, we have no contacts. No All right. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a different topic for a different day, because <laughs> we're not going to sit there and list all the people we know. Uh, but this happens in USC, and yeah, it's not Colorado. USC is the Pied Piper that makes all this happen. But what made the Pac-12 presidents, and again, let's go back to September last year, you and I talked about the $50 million per school that George demanded, George Klyovkov. But it comes from the presidents, and you and I knew that 30 was on the table for ESPN. What made them think that they could get that much more? So, the long answer. Um, what happened with the Pac-12 started in 2011. And if you look back through the entire time frame. Is this is this when Bill Moose is this when Bill Moose said everybody needs to have an equal share? It was Bill Moose and Larry Scott. Yep. When they signed the three billion dollar deal and it was the biggest deal going at the time and they were gonna roll out the Pac-12 networks. And if you look at that and let's we can get into that in detail. Um, in summary and then we can go into detail of how this fell apart and why they thought they could get fifty million dollars. Um, the person who comes across actually as, as kind of the, the worst bad guy at the end of the process is USC. It's Carol Cole. Because yeah. Yeah. they believed at the time when they had Texas Tech and, and they had four schools looking to join. And Carol Cole blocked it. The same university that then left 18 months later blocked four new schools coming in. And when the four new schools were coming in, those were the numbers that were being put in front of them were 45 to $60 million dollars. Right, and, and the argument was made that we don't need them. We can still drive that kind of that kind of dollar amount, especially if we can get our um, our major national brands back to prominence. And that's that's USC, UCLA, uh, Washington, kind of Oregon. I know Oregon likes to think that they're nationally prominent, but you know, you're not meeting anybody in New York who's watching the Oregon game. And so that's where the number came from. And so it's just like anything else. So to try to put it in a layman's terms as much as possible, and how it's been explained to me a lot by people who are in the room, right? Um, and, you know, Mike Bone's a friend. Um, he was, he, thank goodness for him. He, I'm not, I'm, I'm not standing up for anything that he is accused of doing. I don't know what that is, but he was part of the reason that USC got out of this. When people, uh, when their house depreciates in value or something happens, they just have a hard time understanding or appreciating that that's what it is now, right? There's, there's an old saying that the market is the market. Um, it's much like how we're looking at, you know, Penn State grad Saquon Barkley saying, I should be getting historical running back numbers, and the market's coming back and saying, that's not the market anymore. And so he's holding out. That's right. what happened with the Pac-12 president. Right. They just have this this psychological disposition that, well, no, that can't be real, that we can't get 50 million and 30 million, which is the number, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you know it better than I do. I think the Big 12, when 
USC was going to poach the four teams after Oklahoma and Texas left was was around thirty million, right? Yes, it was like yeah. twenty seven to thirty one yes. million. Yes, yeah. so they were. You have a you have a group of very powerful people who nobody says no to them, sitting in a room saying, "Wait a minute, we could have just bought those four houses for thirty million dollars, and we thought that was nowhere close to enough money, and now you're telling us that's all we can get? No, right? right. We need fifty. And going back to what you said about Bill Moose, so. I'm going to bore the listeners for a second, unless they care about this. But in 2011, Larry Scott signs this deal with um, the, the three and a half billion dollar deal, biggest deal in sports. He's going to roll out the Pac-12 networks, even though he has no carriage rights. He completely blunders that. Larry Scott makes 50 million dollars to essentially crater a hundred year old conference. Mm-hmm. But Bill Moose sits down at the table with Larry Scott and the rest of the and UCLA and USC come and they do what everybody has done with every league that's formed in the past, and they said, "Look, we are." stocking horses here we are the biggest brands we need a bigger share and and anybody can sit there and say that doesn't seem fair but it is fair it's not any different than in the big 10 right Rutgers shouldn't get the same share as Penn State we just know it and people know it the English Premier League was built that way around the top five teams getting more money and the NFL thank goodness for the Maras or the Maras and the um, Rooney's and and the original owners yep. because they were the same way New York and Green Bay were driving all the money and they were taking more, but they were making sure everything was taken care of. So Bill Moose, who, for your listeners, will recognize him from um, hiring Scott Frost in Nebraska, um, he, he was the guy at Oregon that kind of helped them come to prominence under Phil Knight's time. He hired Michael Audie, and they got a little more prominent. He is the AD at Washington State at the time. And he comes back and says, no, everybody should get an equal share, and we want to build our sub-brands into national powerhouses. We think Washington State should be a national name. He honestly believed this. And so he demanded and got the teams to vote and the presidents to vote to get the same amount of money to Washington State that goes to USC for football. And he takes the money and he spends $8 million on Mike Leach every year, and he builds a ridiculous stadium that nobody goes to in Pullman. We talked about this. I believe that was the day that USC was gone. Right? Because at the time, USC is under um, restriction from the NCAA. Yep. They've got the sanctions on them. The team sucks. Lane Kiffin had been fired a year prior. Um, they're down, and now they're getting kicked while they're down. It was a matter of time before we got to this point where USC said, okay, this isn't going to work anymore. This isn't the SEC. This isn't the Big Ten. I mean, the Big Ten has how many nationally prominent brands? You know, Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan. You have a lot of nationally prominent brands. Yep. The Pac-12, um, people on the West Coast may not believe this, but I'm sure your listeners would agree. You really don't have much. You, Arizona basketball, UCLA basketball, USC football, used to be US, UCLA football, Washington from time to time, you know, Oregon from time to time. Nobody cares about the rest. Nobody, nobody's staying up late to watch Stanford play, you know, Arizona State. No. no. And, and that's what happens. And, and, and so you have these chancellors and these presidents saying, hold on a second, <laughs> three years ago, you're telling us $30 million is nowhere near enough. It's going to evaporate the Big 12. And we're going to go take four of their teams. And now you're telling me I have to accept $30 million? No. Right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and that's exactly I mean, right. That's exactly and that's what it comes down to. Now, and, and I'd like to point I've never, to my knowledge, I've never met Carol Fultz. I do know what her reputation is, though. And she is, quote, not a shrinking violet. In other words, she's a very, I mean, she has a backbone to her and she has opinions. She has opinions. She does. And, and she's done a great job for USC. That's yep. the important thing yep. here. In the end, everybody goes back down to the money. And that's what happened here. You have, I mean, if you think about how ludicrous the timeline of this and how this happened is, it is a case study in selfish idiocy. You had these 10 member schools. This is back before Colorado, Utah joined for these 10 member schools who spend decades demanding an equal share with the national brands, demanding that Oregon State basketball should get the same revenue share as Arizona basketball, demanding that USC football needs to share their money with Cal, who has some of the worst football facilities in the country. They're not even spending it. And you spend decades saying this. You crater your own conference fighting for this and then the minute the conference looks like it's on shaky ground Oregon and Washington 
the two schools who believed they were closest to USC and UCLA take a cut rate share to join the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. So you literally spent decades saying, I am worth exactly as much as these two schools until Kevin Warren and Carol Fulton and everybody, the big kids, get involved, and they say you're not. And you can either take what you're worth, because the market is the market, or you can go play in the Mountain West. And they took I the long... It's, it's amazing. Right. And they took the long-term play with the next contract where they're going to get a, a, an equal share down the road. That's what they're counting on. Uh, Apple, yeah. Apple offered $23 million, then kicked it up to 25 I don't think yeah. people realize, Tony, how tough a negotiator Apple is. And they are, again, let's go back to the term shrinking violet. That's not Apple. No. So... What, what's fascinating about Apple and all of this, and what's fascinating, I mean, and to get back to the share uh, piece for the listeners, Stanford and Cal said they take nothing in their first year in the ACC. That's right. So you went from cratering your 100-year-old conference because you demanded every single penny that UCLA and USC got to, I'll take nothing, I just want to be on the team. Yeah. That is shockingly idiotic from two supposedly prominent universities aren't you think tanks this is this is you guys have a you have a graduate school of business at stanford that's internationally prominent couldn't brought somebody in to help you out with this one (laughs) you ended up with nothing i mean talk about buffoonery and then you went and publicly uh pitched yourself out to the acc who said no Yep. I mean, you're, the, you're supposed to be the Director's Cup champion, right? So Stanford has won 26 of the last 29 Director's Cup. This is the who wins the most national championships across all sports. Because Stanford dominates in the Olympic sports, and they always have. Two, you're going to play in the Mountain West? Yeah. yeah. I mean, how does that look for recruits? You know how we were going to USC and UCLA and Arizona? Uh, we're going to Boise State now. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's, yeah, let's go to Fort Collins. Have a good time. Uh, yeah, enjoy it. Yeah. So the crazy thing about the Apple point, so to your point with Apple is, uh, one thing that's getting lost in all this is Apple doesn't just make up dollars. If they didn't get this deal, they're not done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're not done. They have budget set aside, and they have identified this as a way that they want to continue to build in their live events portfolio. So you better believe that the Big Ten's talking to them. You better believe that the SEC's talking to them about streaming rights, about how do we work around contracts so we don't end up in a position like the ACC is? Which, by the way, we've been talking forever about that grant of rights. How excited is the ACC about that grant of rights right now? Because without it, Florida State is long gone, and Clemson's following them. Well, I've, I've said this, two parts to the grant of rights. Number one, if it was so easy to break, why are Texas and Oklahoma paying $50 million each between grant of rights and exit fee to get out of the last year of the deal? And number two, Florida State's been grumbling about this for 18 months. If you can't find it in 18 months, the key sentence that can get you out of it, it's not there. It's not there. And 2036, that's 13 more years, my friend. Yep. You've got a long way to go, Florida State. A long way to go. And the numbers are stark. It's a $120 million exit fee, and the total media rights over 13 years involving Florida State is $500 million on the grant of rights. They would have to negotiate an incredible sweetheart deal. You're talking $500 million when it's all said and done to get to 2036, because every Florida State home game, if they just break it and go, would all revert to the ACC. Yep, every single one. And so you know that Apple, who knows people that we don't know, is involved in every one of these talks. Yep. Every one of them. So what the Big 12 did that was so smart is they went and hired the mega players. They went and hired William Morris. For the listeners who don't know who William Morris is, William Morris Endeavor, um, William Morris bought Endeavor. Endeavor was Ari, um, Ari Emanuel's firm. The listeners who watched Entourage will know who Ari Gold is. It's that firm. <laughs> yes. Right? He, he, he called in, they called in the hitters. Brett Yarmark showed up and said, I'm not going to goof around with this. I'm going to pay the people who can get meetings I can't get, and we are going to turn this into a power conference. And he did a great job of selling to the universities what that share was going to be, and now he's sitting great. He got Colorado back. 
I mean, look, Dion's only going to be there for two or three years. Sure. But it's a sure. good win to get Colorado sure. back. They were originally a Big 8 member. And you get Arizona basketball, which really helps with Texas leaving. It plugs in that, that rival mm-hmm. that Kansas needs on the basketball side. Yep. But you and I both know this is all about football. It's all no, no, basketball doesn't even come up in the conversation on this. Well, what's interesting, and your mark has nothing to do with what I'm about to say, but if you notice, where is the grant of rights filed for the Big 12 where you get kind of that kind of corporate relief that you need? The grant of rights for the Big 12 is filed in Delaware, which is, you know, okay, a lot of people don't realize that. That's, that's where it's filed. It's in Delaware. Okay, so now in Delaware, which is where which is where my business is incorporated. Yes, for the same reason. That's exactly why I brought it up because I knew that. <laughs> and there are reasons why you do that, right? There are reasons why a business does that and incorporates in Delaware. So it's corporate protection. It's very difficult for the states to get involved because. What gets lost in a lot of this work, the one thing that shocked me, where I was a little bit wrong, um, I'm wrong a lot, so I'm not defending myself, but remember we talked about this, we said the biggest problem Oregon and Washington are going to have are, uh, it's going to be Oregon State. Because yeah. Oregon, and Washington, Oregon and Oregon State are tied at the hip, just like Washington and Washington State are. It's been pretty well known that Washington State wants to move to the, to the MWC, mm-hmm. right? They're more local to it, you know, Idaho's right there, they, right. It, it just makes more sense for them. Um, but Oregon State didn't. Oregon State is a powerhouse in baseball. Yep. They don't yep. want to move to the Mountain West. Yep. Nope. nope. And now what? They Somehow Oregon got away from them. Somehow the legislature allowed Oregon to separate from Oregon State. I'm not that surprised with Cal and UCLA just because Cal has shown that they don't care about football. Right? Mm-hmm. They've made it pretty clear that football is just not going to be an investor for them. And for the listeners who don't know, Stanford, Stanford Stadium used to fit 90,000 people. It mm-hmm. fits 35,000 now. Yeah. I mean, they just blatantly yeah. came out and said, we're going to cut the attendance in half. People right. aren't coming. Right. 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 Well, in fact, that's where, when it was 90,000 seats, they hosted the Super Bowl. They hosted the Super Bowl 19. Right. All right. So. 49ers. Yep. 49ers beat the Dan Marino's Super Bowl appearance. They beat the Dolphins. So what now? Right. Be- Roger Craig. Right. Right. <laughs> Who should be in the Hall of Fame, by the way. Um, oh, yeah. So what now? What now? For Oregon State, Washington State, Stanford, Cal. I know Rick Neuheisel, who's very passionate about the Pac-10, 12, 8, whatever, because he grew up in it. He's coached in it at two, you know, at, at three different, you know, two different places. So it means a lot to him. Is there any way in a package in a merger they can survive and at least keep the Pac, whatever name? Yes, but here's the problem. Um, the, the, the chip that the PAC has is that they are still considered a Power Five conference. Right. And they're still in negotiation going around about automatic bids in Power Five conferences. Um, and there's the Rose Bowl. The thing that gets lost a lot here is the Rose Bowl. The reason this all happened is because this was really the last year the Rose Bowl had the ability to say, I want it to be... You know, Big Ten, Pac Ten, right? That 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 part of the contract expired after this last game, and now it's going to make it easier. The Rose Bowl is basically saying, "Look, we're part of the CFP now. That tradition is not going to be a part of what we're doing anymore." Right. So, you know, the problem is we, we talk about this a lot. We talk about major markets, but then we talk about the the actual traction that people have in a major market. And so, the schools that are thrown around pretty regularly are kind of like the mid major that want to be bigger, the Fresno State, mm-hmm. the San, San Diego, Diego State. State. I mean, I would challenge I would challenge anybody in Pennsylvania to even point to me on a map where Fresno is. <laughs> right? I mean, we know where it is out here. I used to drive through there. But right. Right. Fresno, you know, they, they use a lot of loose numbers to say, well, the entire valley is technically Fresno, therefore we have, you know, 600,000, you know, mm. viewer homes mm. signed up as opposed to 200,000, but it's not. I mean, right. it, it's a really wide base that they're trying to get to. Uh, Boise State, you know, schools that you would know if you're watching late night games, but they're just not nationally prominent. So the biggest problem that they have and why they need, why they really need some kind of merger with the ACC is the, the bid to the CFP eventually. They don't want to become a group of five school. The problem, for your listeners uh, that may not know, is that, you know, the ACC, unlike many conferences, actually has fairly interesting academic 
um, academic requirements, yeah. and Washington State and Oregon State don't meet it. Right. It's the same thing as the funky uh, NC State thing. Like, NC State could never go to the Big Ten. Right. Because right. they're not uh, AAU. AAU or AUU or whatever. A- yeah, yeah, they're, A- not, they're not licensed. Yep. yep. Yeah. And so there's Washington State and Oregon State, they could never make the case to get them into the ACC because they're just not prominent schools when it comes to, you know, the academic side. And then the one that's really lost in the wash here is Arizona State. Yeah. I mean, the number five market in the country, they, it's more populated than just about anywhere now. It's growing faster than anything. Yep. They yep. should be a superpower, but they just can't stop fumbling over themselves. And now where are you? Right? You're thinking, man, we've had some hard times at ASU since Jake Plummer left, and now we're in the Big 12? What the hell just happened? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the next time we talk, I want to – something that is lost in this is that – Networks have paid out so much money for rights. There is a limit as to how far you can go, which the Pac-12 found out, because ESPN desperately wants to keep the NBA contract, and they want to keep the college football playoff contract in some form, You know, at least have the semifinals and finals, maybe an opening round. But see, I want to get into the next time we talk about these network entities trying to make sure that they they balance their books while also making big bids on rights and how they prioritize who is a must have versus nice to have you know it's going to you and I talked about this right buddy it's going to come down to what the NFL and the English Premier League did yep right there's, there's haves and there's have nots and if you allow that have and have nots to get too wide well have not start to disappear and you start to create super conferences which is this looks exactly like the english premier league Mm -hmm. where the top teams just eventually broke away from 100 years of tradition and created the english premier league right and so we're eventually headed towards what it seems what you what you said years ago on the air right Uh, we're all in a 64 team conference and You've got your mega conferences with your your divisions and your playoffs and your national championship, which in the end, to me, seems like the most logical you know endpoint. Anyways, I, I played a non money sport in school, so I went to USC to play volleyball and basketball. Basketball is a money sport, volleyball is not. Yeah. yeah, those football players, I was friends with all of them. You remember many of them? Carson Palmer was in my Bible study. I knew Barry yeah. Zito. Yeah. Chris Claiborne was my lab partner. Yeah, and he got yeah. drafted seventh overall. Yep. Yeah, they are there to study football. Mm-hmm. And everybody hand wringing and saying, "Oh, well, this is an academic institution." You can make just as much money, have just as much impact on the world, and, and have a great vocation in football as you can in anthropology. Mm-hmm. It is a job. So there, this this hand wringing about, I can't believe USC is going to fly all the way across the country to. Why not? If they're going to end up being scouts or coaches or working on the business side of an NFL team, that's what they're going to do. The Philadelphia Eagles staff flies across the country on the weekends. Yeah. They balance their work with needing to do that. Isn't college for that, to prepare your, your vocation for the real world? Exactly. So I think there's. Uh, I think we've got a couple of things to talk about. But I'm on the other side of that. I think these football players, this is a good thing for them. I, I am too. I, I think at the end it's, in, it's not going to be as complicated as people think. And there's a, way, there's a way with the other sports to make it work. My friend... The fact that you're safe and sound is, and your family is safe and sound is all it means to me, but it is, man, that went fast, didn't it? <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Next thing you know, we're going to be talking after you guys pound out West Virginia, right? You got them in a couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Two weeks yep. from Saturday. So I think I'll go to practice. I, I cannot wait to see your quarterback. This is, if you guys have a quarterback, this could be your year. Uh, you're going to like him. You're going to like them. All right. Em. You're going to like them. Like okay. okay. My friend, My friend. Always, always a pleasure. A pleasure. I, cannot I cannot wait until, wait the, next until the next conversation. All right, buddy. We'll talk soon. Certain guys that, whatever reason, thrive in this, and they may not be the superstar. Clayton Kershaw has been up and down in this. A guy like John Lester thrived in this. What is it about yeah. Zach Wheeler where he seems to thrive in this? What you know, Because it seems like his heart rate's 45. Yeah, I think you just said it. I mean, he uh, there's no difference um, 
I can tell you, in being around Zach Wheeler in the postseason uh, as opposed to the regular season, there's no difference in the demeanor, in the attitude, in the preparation, in the routine. And I have to believe that it's not a facade. It's it's real. It's genuine. You know, everyone likes to say, oh, it's just another game, or postseason is just an extension of the regular season. It's another thing to to believe it and to uh, um, and to perform accordingly. And I, I think the Phillies have a, a number of players, including Zach Wheeler, who do that, who who can kind of compartmentalize, you know, the stakes being higher, but also, you know, trying to normalize the situation and figure out a way to get through it. He does that. He pitches really well at home. Um, I'm at Truist Park right now. He was born about five minutes away from here. He grew up right near here. He pitches very, very well in his hometown. Uh, I think um, I think the Phillies have got to be really comfortable with the fact that he's going to the mound today with a chance to give them a 2-0 lead in the best of five series. And um, you know, the Braves have seen enough of him. They know what to expect. He's got a combination of velocity and just an understanding how to pitch. You know, he added a sweeper, uh, which is a variation of a slider this year, right, and right. given him another weapon to go to. And, you know, I think all you got to do to understand what makes Wheeler so tough is talk to Aaron Nola. Aaron Nola likes to talk about how Zach Wheeler can pitch at 98, 97, 98, or, you know, and overpower you, or he can pitch to you. You know, he can really work you over with some off-speed and uh, secondary stuff, and there aren't a whole lot of guys in the league, including Aaron Nola, that can do that. So... Um, you know, Wheeler's got, got, you know, got it all really. And, uh, and, and like you said, the attitude and the kind of the demeanor to succeed in October. Because every time I hear somebody say, well, you know, it's just like the regular season, same approach and so forth. I always ask myself, are they can trying to convince me or convince themselves? Right. Right. And, and Wheeler is not one of those guys, right, you know, exactly. asked a lot yep. about it. But, you know, he's not one of those guys who walks around saying, oh, it's just the same. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's those guys who are trying to talk themselves into it rather than feeling it. And he definitely feels that it's just, it's just, you know, he's able to handle it, and not everybody is. I do have to ask you about this guy. He's pitching for the Twins, but you saw him pitch with the Marlins for years, and that's Pablo Lopez. I saw, there's a stat on him that blew me away. Everybody talks about first, second, and third time through the order. This season against him, first time through the order, they're hitting 249. Second time through the order, they're hitting 238. Two, third time through the order, they're hitting 229. Really? Yeah. This guy defies analytics. Now, you saw him pitch a lot with Miami. But when you hear something like that, what runs through your mind in this analytics world? Don't you love that? Don't you love that? Because... Um there aren't enough pitchers these days who get who get the opportunity to go through a lineup for the third time, yeah. no less succeed doing it. And look, um, from an analytic standpoint, it, it makes sense, right? That right. the second time you'd see a pitcher, the third time you'd see a pitcher, you've your odds of of having success against that pitcher goes up, right? That it gets harder for the pitcher the more they they see you. What it tells me about Pablo Lopez is that. Like Zach Wheeler, I mean, we're talking about a pitcher who can attack you in a lot of different ways. He's obviously showing hitters much different looks the second and third time around. Yep, yep. Not the same thing. And so it keeps them, and that to me is pitching. That to me is yep, yep. is what pitching is all about, is disruption of a hitter's timing. And how do you disrupt a hitter's timing? You throw different looks at them. You throw different pitches at them. You vary your speeds. You vary your delivery in some cases. So uh, when I see that and I watch a guy like him pitch, I kind of think of, of a throwback guy, a pitcher who can get you deep in a game. Uh, and maybe in, in Miami um, all those years, we underappreciated Pablo Lopez because he pitched alongside Sandy Alcantara. Yep. And it seemed like, you know, um, it seemed like every year, no matter the season they had, the Marlins had arms that they could throw at you. And look, the Marlins, you know, um, the, the Twins, in order to acquire Pablo Lopez, traded the batting champ, Luis Arise, yep. who had a great year with the Marlins. So it tells you that the Marlins and the Twins both understood the value of Pablo Lopez. I, I also love that trade. I love the fact that it was an old-fashioned baseball trade, good player for good player, and it made both teams better, ultimately. Um, so, you know, I'm sure the Marlins would have loved to have had Pablo Lopez start Game 1 against the Phillies last week, but they also loved having Luis Arise at the top of their lineup all year. Right. So... Um, 
you know, I think that uh, I think it was a good um, a good baseball trade, and he's a, obviously a really good pitcher. Yeah, I know it was off topic, but I just thought it was so interesting. Uh, all right, so Max Freed goes tonight for Atlanta. We already talked about Wheeler. Freed only, you know, with everything that he's gone through this year, he only ended up making 14 appearances. How the Phillies dealt with him over time? You know, he's a good pitcher. Um, kind of reminds me of like little Cole Hamels. Um, you know, uh, he's left-handed. He's got a lot. He's got really good stuff. Doesn't seem to come unnerved. Uh, the Braves' record when he pitches over the years is tremendous. Obviously, some of that has to do with the fact that they're a really good team, uh, and I'll bet their record with most of their starters on the mound is good. But with his, it's really good. It's something like eighty-seven and thirty-three or forty-three, something like that. They're well, way over five hundred with Max Freed. The question tonight, it's all going to be about his left index finger. He's had a blister on that finger, which developed in his last start in late September. He missed his last two starts. He pitched a simulated game, I think it was Tuesday, here in Atlanta. He said he came through it fine. Um, he's had blister problems in the past, so this isn't new to him. He's dealt with this stuff before, and he's obviously got a, a handle on how to do it. But the question is not only the quality of the stuff, but it's also how long is it going to? Is, is he going to be able to go? Because if he should, you know, if that blister should redevelop or if it should tear, um, you know, it's not going to be. He's not going to be long for the game. So I think everyone's going to be looking to see how his his finger responds. Um, but if he's healthy, I think the Phillies have their hands full because he's a really good left-handed pitcher, and and uh, you know, like I said, the Braves uh, count on him a lot and play really well behind him. So. Um, they're counting on him, though, not only tonight, but also a potential Game 5. They'd have to get there, of course, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but uh, they're counting on having him pitch twice in this series. And, um, you know, it's all going to depend on how much, uh, uh, you know, on how healthy that blister is. Uh, oh, eight pitches, seven sweepers. Orion Kirkring, who, when he was down at the academy, had what was termed a very bad curveball. Well, those seven pitches he threw uh, of the eight were sweepers. What have you What have you seen in this remarkable story? Yeah, he had uh, what his uh, college coach described as a very bad curveball, and so what they did was they taught him how to throw a slider, and it turns out it might be one of the best sliders in baseball, if not the best. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean all of baseball. You know, it was certainly one of the best pitches in the minor leagues all year. Um, there is a bit of an X factor to this too. You know, like there aren't a whole lot of secrets between the Phillies and Braves. They play each other so often. Uh, during the regular season, but the Braves had not seen Orion Kirkering until uh, Saturday night, um, not live at least. And, uh, you know, the way he mowed through the bottom of that order in eight pitches, and then, he, you know, they trust him enough to send him back out to face Acuna to start the eighth. He walked Acuna, but, um, you know, the fact that they had him in that spot in the first place tells you that it's not just lip service, that Rob Thompson's not just saying, yeah, I trust this guy. He really does trust him. I would expect to see him in leverage spots tonight uh, and then obviously going forward in this series um, because they're clearly not afraid to use him, and he's got great stuff. And Talk about another guy who just seems to be unfazed by it all. I mean, this is somebody who started the season in low A, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> kind of soared through the system, didn't get to the big leagues until the end of September, made three appearances uh, in the regular season for uh, in the major leagues. Um Jeff Hoffman calls him the diaper because uh, <laughs> he's so young and inexperienced, and uh, you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it from watching him. And I talked to people and said, "Like, can you give me something to compare this to?" And the name that the names that people come up with are like David Price in 2008, came to the big leagues late in the season and was a factor for the Rays in the bullpen in the postseason. Francisco Rodriguez, K. Rod in 2002 with the Angels started the year and spent most of the year in the minor leagues, came up in late September was a factor in the postseason. And, boy, if the Phillies have that on their hands with Orion Kirkering, uh, it's going to be something to watch for as long as they uh, they continue to play in the postseason. Yeah, I think, what, Kirkering was a fifth-round pick? Something like that. Yeah. David, yeah. David yep. Price was first overall. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and the fact that, um, you know, those are examples that that you get, it tells you that there's really not a – I don't know that there is really a, uh, you know, apples to apples because, like right, you said, right. fifth round pick, start of the year was not on anybody's prospect list and everything like that. Uh, it's been meteoric, a meteoric rise to say the least. Yeah, you have players in the field going, 
We're putting who in? I don't remember this guy from earlier in the year. And by the way, walking Acuna on four pitches is no sin. All right. So, <laughs> hey, You're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Scott, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us from the ballpark today. Really appreciate it. Of course, Steve, anytime. The outstanding Scott Laver, Philadelphia Inquirer.